Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Darsh Shah. And I'm Dr. Ultima Shraja. And welcome to Medicine Redefined. A podcast where we will explore the often overlooked but necessary components of health, what we consider to be the fundamentals. We will investigate topics and practices that can give you and your patients the best chance to optimize a healthy lifestyle. It's time to move the needle forward and put the health back in healthcare. All right, welcome back everyone to another progress note sitting across from me on the screen, Dr. Altamash Raja. First off, man, you had some new travels to Banff country. How was it? Amazing. As we spoke about offline, I think it was definitely, uh, I think this is the first time I got to visit some place that was, that's been on the bucket list for quite some time. And anybody who is not familiar, if you just quickly Google it, uh, you'll know why that's the case. And it was absolutely gorgeous. I think three days in, I was just like, I can't wait to come back because you realize quickly as you get there, despite having an agenda and having chat GPT planned for me, that there's just no way <laughs> um, as you start talking to people of all the things you have to see. And, you know, I, I went in the beginning of October, so the weather, it wasn't the most cooperative, but I think for the most part, it's pretty good. Um, and then there are certain places that are just more conducive to visiting in the summertime and just because of the area and and the slopes and the avalanche zone and whatnot. So can't wait to go back already. Uh, I'm stoked, but yeah, absolutely gorgeous place that I think everybody needs to visit, especially if you're kind of in that nature-esque thing that, that turns you on. Did you end up hiking? Cause I know you have a little girl. So what did you like end up doing as far as yeah. the scenery and nature goes? I'd say modified hikes. Um, we, some of the, <laughs> some places we, it took a stroller to where a stroller was not meant to go. And so I'm, I'm surprised that stroller still made it back in one piece. Um, like Johnston Canyon is this really cool place where you kind of go down and up a Canyon and you had from waterfalls mm-hmm. that you can see. And that was not stroller friendly, but we made it happen anyway. Um, and other places you just kind of just do the baby carrier and stuff. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah. I, I mean, every place that you go to like Lake Louise, the big one that everybody sees when they Google it, right. That's like this calm water, perfectly blue turquoise water um and uh they have so many different trails like it just depends like if you want to take the two kilometer trail or the six kilometer trail or the 12 kilometer trail Mm -hmm. and they have all these little tea times that you can go up to uh which is really really nice but definitely definitely worth checking out amazing definitely adding it to the bucket list so yep awesome well why don't you set us up with today's topic um give us a little introduction on what we're going to be going through yeah, this one is going to be a brand new one, right? So we are going to be talking about COVID after several years. And so we've, we touched on it here and there, and probably not in the sense that that people are thinking there's going to be nothing political here that we're going to talk about. We're going to look at the science of it. And not just SARS-CoV-2 virus or COVID-19, the infection, but really a, a specific disease called long COVID, um, also referred to as long haul COVID. Some people call it post-COVID, chronic COVID, post-acute sequelae of COVID. SARS-CoV-2 um, is recognized by multiple names. And I think at this point is relatively well recognized by the medical community as a legitimate diagnosis, as a legitimate uh, distinct disease um, or sequelae of COVID-19. So what is it? As the name suggests, this is either prolonged recovery um, or prolonged symptoms of uh, COVID-19 or you know people who've had recurrence of multiple COVID-19 infections. Um, that's just lingered on and they haven't quite recovered, quite haven't been the same after they have recovered from just the standard, you know, the URI type symptoms, if you're lucky enough to not have a very severe illness. And the challenge with this specific disease has been for a long time uh, for people to admit that, hey, this is a real issue. Um, It's because it presents with a wide variety of nonspecific symptoms spanning multiple different organ systems in the body. Right? So you have these non-specific constitutional symptoms like malaise, fatigue, you have brain fog, you have mood-related stuff, you can have some cardiovascular stuff, you know, in terms of like e- even congestive heart failure type symptoms or just shortness of breath or decreased um, you know, exertional capacity, et cetera, et cetera. You can have vague GI-related symptoms. So it's very hard to diagnose. And the other challenge is that there aren't any specific diagnostic tests, right? Um, I mean, we know that if you're positive for COVID-19, you know, you might be positive for quite some time, or even if you're no longer positive after you've had, um, you know, clearing quote unquote of infection, you could still have these symptoms. And so it's a clinical diagnosis. 
it actually reminds me of something called post-concussive syndrome. So these miserable minority that we talk about, these are the people that we see, right? So concussion, everybody's familiar with concussion. And there's a very small subset of population, probably less than 10% of individuals who have these symptoms that persist, right? Three months, six months, two years. I've got a very young patient who is just completely taking her life because she's two years in after getting hit by a wave. Um, and the challenge was that, again, because it's a clinical diagnosis, you know, a lot of physicians would say, oh, that's not really a thing. And, you know, that's a different debate. Hmm. But um, the other interesting thing about this is for a long time, we, and actually still, we don't really know the causes and we have a poor understanding, although that understanding is developing, right? So some of the proposed theories are that the SARS-CoV-2 particle becomes reactivated over time, you know, and then it it goes into... Um, What's the more like, like suppression almost and become reactivated. So it's these recurrent reactivation times and then the symptoms will reappear. Um, there's the immune theory where you have these overactive immune cells and they are constantly releasing inflammatory markers. And so you have this prolonged inflammatory state, which, you know, uh, chronic inflammation typically not associated with good outcomes. Um, there's from the other immune theories, there's also your uh, immune system is uh, has created autoantibodies, right, which are wrecking havoc on the system, right? So it's kind of like an auto, autoimmune type situation. And then the topic of today's discussion, somewhat of a novel theory, is the serotonin uh, mismatch or serotonin deficit, so to speak, uh, what we're going to talk about. But before we do that, a couple other things. So risk factors wise, you know, folks who've had a severe illness, who've been hospitalized, weaker immune system, comorbidities, underlying health conditions, the non-vaccinated, as they say, this is what the science says, not me. Um, you know, other potential risk factors could be female sex, the elderly population, uh, a high immune response, again, very similar to things that we've already talked about. Um, and with respect to treatment, there really isn't one, right? So it's just supportive management of symptoms. Uh, although there are several studies that I was uh, able to find, you know, several clinical trials, like the RECOVER trial is a big one, looking at Paxlovid and uh, its role in long COVID. And there are several other observational studies as well in terms of both symptomatically and different treatments, whether it's exercise and whatnot. So um, I, it does look like a lot of people are finally putting a lot of attention into this. Um, and I think, you know, one of the interesting in our world, I don't know if you've seen this in your rehab experience was that we were getting a lot of patients after this who needed acute inpatient rehab because they just had chronic debility from their COVID type system. And so we even had like a COVID clinic when I was in residency, they were building that towards that. And there was actually a COVID, you know, prolonged COVID section, part of the rehab facility that these patients like maybe, I think we may, may have allocated four or six beds to that, uh, if I remember correctly. So um, with that, um, I am going to hand it over to you and, and let's, uh, let's chat about this uh, serotonin stuff here. Yeah, absolutely. So just to kind of highlight what you were talking about, right? You you did a great job mentioning all the different theories. And so the one that we're going to talk about, which has been highlighted um, as a potential theory in the original, you know, so-called papers talking about long COVID is the dysbiosis theory. So essentially the gut microbiota um, get altered. And because of that, it wreaks havoc on a lot of different systems. So recently at UPenn, uh, they did some research and it got published in the journal Cell. And this was probably maybe a week or two ago. And, you know, we're recording this, what, October 19th. So what they are proposing is that this other theory called the theory of viral persistence, right? So obviously, once you have COVID, not all the viral particles go away. And so they measured it in the feces that there were a certain number of remaining particles in the body. And because it was in the feces, it obviously means it was in the gut. And so what they found was that in long COVID, these viral particles would disrupt the neurotransmitters in the gut, specifically serotonin. And, you know, just to back up, what we've talked about multiple times on this podcast is the importance of the gut and how 80 to 90% of the immune system relies on the gut, as well as the gut brain connection. So we know from the vagus nerve, we know from neurotransmitters, uh, dopamine, serotonin, they're primarily in the gut, and that can actually affect our mood which is why hopefully in a future topic, we'll talk about nutrition and how nutrition and the foods you eat can actually affect your mood. But getting back to this, so what they found was that the viral, the viral reservoirs, right? So they've been persistently high. And the first thing that they found was that because of that, you would have persistently high levels of type one interferons, right? So what does that mean? Type one interferons, basically in the immune system, your immune system's activated. It's essentially fighting against something that 
may not even be causing something, right? So these viral particles, even though they're at a decreased number, they're not going to have the same effect as you possibly would if you tested COVID positive. But yet, because you have these inflammatory markers and immune markers at such high levels, the body's going to react to that. The second thing they found is that this viral infection altered amino acid uptake. And primarily, they found that it was tryptophan that, was a, that wasn't able to, uh, to become, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not uptaked, but uh, no, absorbed. Absorbed is the word I'm looking sure. for. So, yeah. So because of that, right, tryptophan Although has I like metabolites. Uptaked. I like that one. Uptaked. Yeah, I might, I might use that, throw, throw it around here and there. It sounds scientific. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but essentially, tryptophan has different metabolites. One is niacin, right? So vitamin B3, NAD, which we always talk about with the mitochondria, anti-aging. I mean, in this case, probably more mitochondria. And melatonin, which, I mean, I think if people read, I don't know if you saw Dr. Atiyah's, um, Peter Atiyah's, one of his uh, newsletters talking about melatonin and long-term effects and things about how we really don't know how it affects circadian rhythm and hormones. It becomes a big player and not as innocuous as, as people think it is. Um, but essentially, again, because you're having this post-acute COVID syndrome, you're going to have these metabolites not working properly. All right. Now, third, this is where it gets really interesting, right? This is where we start to put all the theories together. So you mentioned theory of you know platelets, um, aggregation, hypercoagulability. And so what they found was that um, there there becomes a formation of microthrombi, right? As a result of hypercoagulability. Um, and because you have reduced serotonin storage, this enhances essentially the turnover of serotonin um, and the degradation products. So you basically get hypercoagulable states even with a decreased serotonin. And, you know, there's this whole complex interaction it has with uh, the MAO enzyme, MAO. Uh, for people who want to understand MAO, I mean, you can go down multiple rabbit holes. I think a good episode to turn to is either part one or part two with Will Bolsewich. Uh, I think we, we we talked a lot about MAO um, and the role that it has in the gut with him. Now, I was going to say, um, at, at some point, do you think it's worth explaining to people what serotonin is? I, I think we presume that the listeners here know what serotonin is, but That's perhaps true. maybe somebody tuning in is like, what is exactly serotonin? <laughs> Sure. Yeah. So it's a neurotransmitter that we know, right? And we liken it to be the happiness molecule. So oftentimes when it comes to anxiety and depression, serotonin is our main target. So people may have heard of Lexapro or Prozac or Zoloft, right? These are all SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, right? So essentially you are not allowing serotonin to get reuptaked <laughs> um, by certain um neurons, certain processes. And so you're letting serotonin be in the bloodstream. And serotonin essentially in that case is making you happier, right? Because it's the happiness molecule. I'm sure there are multiple major effects as we are, as I'm now learning too. I mean, as we go through training, we really learn serotonin is just this molecule of the brain. We now know it's in the gut, but we really just look at it from a depression and mood standpoint. But obviously from this paper about having decreased serotonin due to COVID, Talking about all the multi-system abnormalities that people have, um, it's fair to say that, wow, serotonin has a bigger role than you know I even knew before reading this paper. Absolutely. And in terms of the, the tryptan, uh, tryptophan part that we talked about, tryptophan is actually a pre precursor to serotonin, serotonin right? Yep. And, and that's where some people will come in. Yeah. So tryptophan and turkey, since we're Thanksgiving's right around the corner of my favorite holiday. Um, so when we look at the downstream reactions of tryptophan, I think there is a one intermediate step if I'm remembering, and then that'll eventually downstream go down to tryptophan. And so again, happy, positive mood um, can also make you sleepy in terms of that, right? So um, and another, I suppose, adverse effect of high levels of serotonin um, to kind of relax you in terms of anxiety and stuff uh, that you talked about. So yeah, this is a, this is a very neat, uh, but um, I, you know, I guess uh, the question that becomes is, so so what are our key takeaways? Like, how is this going to matter? Should everybody be taking more SSRIs, right? Is, is, or <laughs> did they talk a little bit about whether, um, you know, modulating serotonin um, is a potential treatment? Did they discuss that at all? So I believe, I would have to look at this, that there was another study where they actually looked at bringing back the normal serotonin levels in mice and that their memories have improved. So we also know through the study that there's a hippocampal link from serotonin in the gut. And so when we talk about brain fog, when we talk about memory loss um, in post-COVID syndrome, long COVID, these are the theories that they're throwing out there. 
Um, and then the last thing that I, you know, that's in this discussion of this paper that I, I didn't even realize is that the vagus nerve, which we talked about just in a recent episode with Jyoti Patel, how important it is in the parasympathetic role of calming us down and being able to regulate our fatigue patterns. It's actually the vagus nerve actually responds to peripheral serotonin. Um, and so that's another founding finding that they found um, was that the vagus nerve kind of gets out of whack. And so it could be a big cause as to why people have this tired, almost fibromyalgia-like symptoms um, in long COVID. Um, but it, the, the, the study itself doesn't go through much of what we can do to help it. I think that's obviously going to be next steps as people look into these theories and really look into the serotonin pathways to say, yeah, it doesn't make sense to give these people an SSRI. But then I almost think about on the flip side is that if we take a patient and say, hey, you have long COVID, let's give you SSRI. These are used for depression. How much of a cognitive, you know, um, what are we communicating to them, right? You know, oftentimes when right. you try to use something off label, the, the patients tend to just see that medication for its intended use, which is depression. And a lot of times as providers, we have to say, well, no, we're, we're, we're not using that for this case. We're using it. We're going to repurpose it for your long COVID. But it's interesting. I don't, I don't truly know uh, where they're going to go with this. Yeah. Not to mention... Uh, the adverse effects, right? Every single SSRI is, is notorious yeah. for waking, right? That'll cause depression. Um, there is low libido, right? Uh, erectile dysfunction, things of that nature are some things that are very, very prominent. So depending on the gender of the person and what they're dealing with, uh, there are a lot of um, adverse effects that are unwanted. And so that can cause a lot of problems. You know, I thought uh, I'm interesting. Uh, I find it interesting that you didn't go to this route because uh, if we, you reference the, the, discussion with Dr. Will Bolshevitz, you know, back then, and his proposition here would be, we need to add more fiber, right? So we need to address that gut dysbiosis, particularly, you know, there was another paper that I actually came across, uh, published in Nature earlier this year, uh, I believe it was in March. And I think the first author is Davis, Hannah Davis, right? And so they, uh, this is a really awesome outline as well, in terms of the mechanism and some of the recommendations. And on the bottom of that, they have a really cool table and they talk about the different potential symptoms and, you know, they talk about all those multi-symptoms that you have. But when you come to the gastrointestinal symptoms, they actually recommend probiotics as a treatment. Um, there's a pilot study that that showed that it resolved the GI symptoms and some of the other symptoms, although not all of them uh, specifically. And they even talk about the specific um, specific bacteria that were found to be at higher levels. Um, in this study, they talked about, it's called, oh my God, Rumnococcus scanus and Bacterius vulgatus. <laughs> I'm surprised I got that. And then lower this levels of Game some of the other stuff ones, right? There. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Fecalibacterium prosint. Oh, yeah, yeah. So anyways, I will link that because it is open access for people to check out. But this is what's really cool about this is, again, they go system by system approach. They have some really cool figures in terms of the, the five main theories in terms of mechanisms of action. And then also you know, initial infection and the the hazard ratio for some um, critical illnesses like PE and cardiac arrest. And then when it comes to long COVID, dysautonomia and ME and, and things of that nature. So I thought this was really cool in a general overview. Perhaps I would recommend people to start with this one so you get a deeper understanding of what it is that we're actually talking about. And then you can uh, dive deeper into the serotonin one if that is of interest for you. So yeah, I mean, ultimately really, really cool. I don't think this was anything new or surprising to us, but you know, it's always nice when um, there's a little bit of confirmation bias, right? So again, most recent get Dr. Jyoti Patel, the first time, certainly she was on, we had talked about the gut-brain connection quite a bit and how we tend to address that healthy gut equals healthy brain, right? Again, I don't know if you mentioned this, but this, the 90% number somehow sticks in my mind where that much is actually made in the gut. Is that, is it, yeah. did somebody mention that or am I making that yeah, up? That's no, that's true, 90% right? of like neurotransmitters in the gut, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, uh, you got to mention that. And also, actually, I, if I think of it, very recently, I actually had a discussion with, I think, a psychologist in reference to a patient. Um, have you, not to get too far off track, have you heard of something called gene side testing? Gene side testing? Site. Gene site. Oh, site. Um, yeah, I think, I so had, this no. is a, yeah, talk about, so precision nutrition 101, right? So um, when I was in medical school, this is something really cool. When I was in medical school, I remember during my psychiatry clerkships, my, the psychologist that I was rotating with had communicated with the patient that there are genetic testing that we can do that helps us figure out which specific SSRIs, anchylytics, 
antidepressants the patients are going to respond really well to, right? Because we know we all, all have these unique SNPs and with SSRIs, we, I mean, we got like 20 different ones. So sometimes it's trial and error. Okay, Lexapro didn't work. After four or six weeks, we switched to Prozac, then we switched to, you know, something else and maybe we'll go to Diloxanine, et cetera. And they had mentioned that. And when I started working last year, I realized one of my partners was doing this. So we get this genetic testing and, and we evaluate. And uh, so I started doing this because of course, you can use a lot of these medications and, you know, I treat pain and chronic pain and it's hard to dissociate pain and anxiety as we talked about before. And so I've actually started doing it in quite a few of my patients. Um, and it's, is, it's really that, neat. Now that is it out of pocket or insurance covering that? Uh, I've had great luck with insurance covering it. I have yet to have a patient who has to pay it out of pocket. So that's actually very wow. cool. Um, there are other companies that do it. Again, this is just the company that we use in my practice. But uh, yeah, it's really neat because it, it's just a simple cheek swab um, and they'll give you all this information in terms of which agents are going to be. So it'll give you just simple green, yellow, red um, are, are going to be, is that person going to be uh, more responsive to a certain agent? So um, I think that's pretty cool too. Again, a little out of the scope of this discussion right here, but I, I thought it was a, a good thing to, to bring to your attention, something you can check out for next year. Yeah, for sure. No, this is super cool stuff. And I'm just glad, like you said, that we can finally put a little bit of data behind maybe what we're seeing. Uh, you mentioned post-concussive syndrome and, you know, in our uh, clinic, in our program, we're definitely not allowed to write that in our notes. So we're always told, uh, you know, it's not really a thing. Yeah, you know, a lot of, yeah. And a lot, a lot of the providers also say the same thing about long COVID, you know, and, and that the sense is like, there's no, it's not a true syndrome, right? In the sense that we don't have a constellation of symptoms that everybody shows. But yet, I mean, you look at these research papers and it even says it in the discussion here, like there's highly heterogeneous Everyone, we all know that whoever gets long COVID, they're going to deal with it different. But I think a lot of providers like to chalk it up to, uh, it might just be self-manifestation, just going through COVID um, and who knows. Right. Um, but I think that's what we like as lifestyle, somewhat of a functional medicine approach to things is regardless of, you know, right or wrong, black or white, people feel a certain way because of their constitution, because of something in their body, because of their mentality. And that all affects one another. Um, so I just hope I like my biggest wish is that people keep that in mind, right? Is that there still is something underlying, even if it is self-manifested. Uh, totally. Well, man, I think this was another great one. Um, I certainly educational for me, this was a topic that I had heard a lot about, but again, selfishly, because it doesn't affect me or I haven't been treating this population. Yeah. I didn't care to read too much about it. So, uh, cool information nonetheless, hopefully somebody's listening to this can um, get some insight and maybe uh, start investigating some of this stuff. Um, if you are interested or you know somebody who is suffering from this, please feel free to send this podcast to them and, and certainly share the resources. Um, you know, if we can educate somebody, maybe we can help somebody uh, improve their quality of life. So, yeah. Yeah, this would be something awesome for those suffering with long COVID to bring up to their doctors um, and just bring the research to them, because I'm sure not a lot of doctors are actually hearing about this and these mechanisms. So it might just make a light bulb go off for some providers. Yeah. All right, man. Another great one in the books. Catch you next time. Thanks for listening to another episode of Medicine Redefined. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to check out some of the additional resources in the show notes. Please also check out our social media platforms where you can find more content like this. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at MedRedefined. We want to take a moment to thank our team for the production of this podcast, specifically Ethan Ju and Haritha Yipri. Lastly, please remember the important disclaimer that everything in this podcast is for educational purposes only. It does not constitute the practice of medicine, nor should it be construed as medical advice. No physician-patient relationship is formed and anything discussed in this podcast does not represent the views of our employers. We recommend that you seek the guidance of your personal physician regarding any specific health-related issues. However, if you enjoy the show, please be sure to subscribe, review, and share with anyone who you would think will gain value from this as well. Until next time, thank you for listening.